My guest today is the one and only Dan Gilford, who has written the book, The Last Voyage of the Whaling Bark Journey. And uh, I'm just curious, what, what got you interested in, uh, in, the, in the voyage and why, why did you write a book about this? So it actually is uh, an interesting story that I think isn't necessarily all that common among historians in that this actually started with my own family. And I think a lot of historians sort of shy away from writing about their own family. You know, we're supposed to, to research other people's families. But in this case, I, I came across an obituary for my great, great grandfather, who I knew was a whaling captain. And in this obituary, um, it had this one sentence that said, that he, and his name, by the way, is also Daniel Gifford. Um, so we share, share that name. And it said that Captain Gifford took a whaling ship named Progress, the whaling ship Progress, to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. And, and that was it. That was the, that was, and then the, the obituary continued on with his other accomplishments. And I just remember that that, struck me as so weird and so interesting you know first of all how do you even get a a whaling ship that that goes in salt water to you know this metropolis on a great lake in in the middle of north america um and then you know what why was it there what what was the story and i guess that's that's ultimately why i wrote this book what was the story what what was going on and it turned out to be this really interesting tale about a, a ship that became a museum about this moment when a, a group of people were trying to capture the memories of an industry that was in decline that was nearly dead but not really dead um, and and it just raised all these questions that as a historian I found so fascinating about you know, how, what happens to a dying industry and how do we commemorate and how do we memorialize it and how do you create a museum to it? And in, and in this case, you know, the, the story turned out to be a story about a failure that the, the ship ultimately was blown up with dynamite in the middle of Lake Michigan. Um, and so, you know, it just, there were all these sort of weird twists and turns that, eventually became a book. And I think, uh, I think, you know, one that, that ostensibly is about a whaling ship's last voyage, but is actually about much more than that. Yeah, and let's, let's start at the beginning. What's the origin of, uh, of this industry and how, how he came, became, in, became a part of the industry, your great, great grandfather? Yeah, so whaling actually has, you know, a really important place in American history certainly international history as well. Um, and, you know, for much of the early 1800s, light was provided by whaling products. You know, you had candles, you had whale oil, you had spermaceti oil, which was a, a better kind of quality, a better product. Uh, even lighthouses, um, were all fueled by the products of whales. And so this huge industry emerges in the United States and of course other, other countries as well, but America really sort of took the lead and New Bedford really took the lead among America um, in, this, in this industry of, of going out on voyages, of chasing whales, capturing whales, and then breaking them down essentially in floating factories uh, breaking them down into this uh, this material that could be used for light, for lighting products, to uh, and and not just light, but also industrial lubricants. You know, much of the industrial revolution came about as a result of of whale oil, and so you know, it's this, it's this really important industry in in American history. Um, you know, the Secretary of State. Uh, called it, you know, America's favorite industry at one point. Um, it, uh, it made New Bedford one of the richest cities in the, in, in the world, really, per capita. Um, you know, and, and 
uh, and certainly becomes very much part of, of American sort of uh, popular culture and sort of the zeitgeist of, of America um, as an industrial nation in the 1800s, that sort of Yankee ingenuity um, that Americans love to, to sort of think of themselves uh, through that lens. And so, you know, it becomes this really dominant industry. And then, of course, as all dominant industries do, there's eventually a decline. Um, and the decline is for, for many reasons. Um, you know, the discovery of, of other uh, lighting sources, uh, petroleum products, kerosene, um, and the like, the decline of whales themselves, right. you know, fishing, you know, I think that you know, certainly resonates today. Um, and so by the time my story comes along, by the time, you know, I'm looking at the ship, um, whaling is essentially a, a ghost of, of its former glory. You know, the heyday is... is how far out did you have to go to catch a whale? Like, well, how close to, to the coast did you have to be? So, I, so one of my chapters, I actually follow, follow not not the the whaling ship Progress, but another ship uh, that actually had a uh, a woman, uh, the captain's wife, on board yeah. that kept a journal. And in her journal, she describes how they aren't very far out at sea before they they capture their first first whale. Um, it's not one of the best. It's not a sperm whale, which is the the sort of gold standard that they were looking for. But it was a good one. You know that happened fairly close to shore and and you know but because this was such a, a labor intensive process and because the stakes were so high people just didn't send a whale ship out you know a ship out for a couple of days and come back these voyages would last for years uh, some voyages you know typical voyages would be three four five years um from you know the time they left New Bedford to the time they came back, and of course you know, they stopped at, at some ports in that time, but most of that was was at sea. And so, you want to be a patient man if you have you know, a rare family man. And that's just it, you know. So captains, you know, had this uh, uh, option um, of sometimes in their wives. Um, you know, it happened. I'd say on about a third of uh, voyages they've calculated. The captain, but, but that was it. The captain was the only one that was given that that prerogative. And so, yeah, for for a lot of men, um, obviously this appealed to young men. This industry appealed to young men who were unmarried. But once you became sort of an officer, you know, uh, third mate, second mate, first mate, you know, chances are you had um, a family back home um, in New Bedford, in this case, um, that you wouldn't see for for years at a time. Was it well paid or was it these poor poorly paid even for the lowest rank in, in the whaling ship, if you will? So the whole pay system was very complicated. It was it was all based on uh, percentages. They were called leads. There was essentially you know a percentage of the profits. Of course, it depended on profits. Um, so if a whale ship you know went down in a hurricane or something like that, um, that was hugely devastating. And uh, the lay system was very uh, lucrative if you owned the ship, if you were the captain of the ship, and if you were, you know, an upper crewman. You know, again, some of those those officers, those those uh, those mates. But you were just your average uh, whaler that signed signed up for a voyage. Chances are you you didn't make much money, and and there was even a strong possibility that you lost money because, of course. During all those years, you you borrowed against the ship. You know, you bought tobacco or or uh, other supplies from from the ship store. And by the time everything was settled up, you know, maybe you ended up owing more than you actually earned uh, at the when when all the uh, the whale oil was priced out and and uh, you got your your percentage. Um, so why why was this, this captivating? That's just the crew. What's that? Why, why was it captivating between if it was so poorly paid? Well, what was it captivating when becoming a sea whale I think, pressure? I think if you think of young men in this era, this, these early 1800s, you know, certainly it was a sense of adventure. Um, again, popular culture sort of feeds into this. There would be a sort of lecture circuits where uh, sort of hucksters would go out and, and talk about 
you know, the uh, the life at sea and and going to exotic ports, seeing you know scantily clad women in the South Seas, and you know, and sell it as as a great adventure uh, for a young man, especially you know one that was born on a farm and you know maybe was one of you know eight, ten, twelve kids. Um, you know, it would be I you see how it would be very appealing um, in in theory. In practice, it was, of course, you know, brutal work, bloody work, disgusting work, um, and as I as I've said, you know, ultimately not very, very lucrative. And in fact, um, you might find yourself um, in in debt more as opposed to being paid. But you know, my own great great grandfather is an example of someone who, in spite of all the hardship. Um, Stuck with it, you know. He joined um, his first boy at the age of 16, uh, and and worked his way up to to captain. I'm sure those first years, you know, were very hard, and, and all the years were very dangerous. Um, but there was a sense, you know, not just the money, but there was a sense of of you know the ability to to uh, that this was meritocracy that you could uh, work your way up. You know, if the, you showed good skills and, and race under pressure uh, and didn't die, um, that you could, uh, you know, sort of make a, make a living out of this, and, and many did. Uh, before we go into the story, I want to know what, we touched briefly on this, but what was like a daily life like on the board of a whaling ship? So it, it was a, daily life was very much uh, a study in contrast, because on the one hand, um, when whales were found, um, the, the lowering of boats in order to chase them, the harpooning, you know, we've all seen, you know, images of, of whaling, I'm sure, you know, where the harpoon is being thrown. Um, the harpoon was not intended to kill the whale. A harpoon was essentially just to attach uh, the boat to a whale. Um, and then, you know, there would be this, this long process of, of tiring the whale out until it could be killed, um, and then the whole process of breaking down the whale. Um, and of course, this happened in you know shark infested waters. You know, you you start cutting into a whale, and all that blood starts spilling out. You know, try so you know hugely dangerous, hugely uh, swift, uh, very skill driven, very um, you know adrenaline pumping. Uh, as I mentioned, extremely. Bory, you know, uh, extremely dirty work. Um, the ultimately the the, the blubber of the whale, the fat of the whale, was rendered down on itself. So you know, you have these uh, furnaces uh, that are burning and, and boiling the fat down to a to a liquid substance. So you know, it's hot, it's smelly, it's smoky. Um, so you know, just you know, lots of drama, lots lots of things going on. And then juxtapose that with weeks and even months of nothing, of solitude, of not spotting a whale. You know, the ocean is huge. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of, you go through uh, huge amounts of, of ocean without ever seeing something that you're looking for, in this case, in this case, whales. And so, you know, juxtapose that sort of sense of adrenaline and danger, excitement, and, and flurry with with just absolute boredom and tedium, and just you know days and days and sometimes even weeks and months of of nothingness of of just you know a flat ocean with nothing on it. Um, I was whaling. That that dichotomy that's that that split was what defined these multi year voyages, and I think. Uh, um, as, I, as we alluded to, yeah, this was a, a rude awakening for for a lot of the young men on their first voyage. That it, w- it was actually like this, but um, but I, that's something I write about in the book is this sort of interesting dichotomy uh, between you know the excitement of of what actually happens when you find a whale and the reality that you know even over the course of three or four years you may not find whales very often. And now we don't, I think we start to get into the story a little bit because who was James T. Olney, and what was, what was his part of this story? So I I start the book with Olney. He's he's actually an interesting one to start because he's not a whaler. Um, he's actually an engraver of all 
um, and a jeweler. But I start with him because he has an important place in New Bedford history. And I start with him because he is the one that creates a city seal for the city of New Bedford. Now, that may sound like a weird beginning for a book about whaling and a book about, you know, a whale ship that goes to the World's Fair. But, but I start with this moment when, when New Bedford becomes a city, uh, is, is sort of given city status by, by the state of Massachusetts, um, and even more so creates a, a city seal, an image that tries to capture this moment, tries to capture the importance of whaling for the city of New Bedford. And I start there because, you know, as I've, I've already alluded to, ultimately where this story goes is the end, you know, the end of whaling. And so I start at this sort of moment when whaling is not just important, it's not just sort of built into the DNA of the city, um, but it almost becomes religious. It almost becomes a, a vocational calling within New Bedford to pursue whaling and to bring, literally bring light to the world. And, <laughs> and the reason James Almay, you know, has a place in that is he, he is the one that engraves this Latin motto, uh, we diffuse light into the city seal. And so you have this moment where you sort of literally see New Bedford embracing this idea of being light bringers, of being you know, almost, you know, and, you know, like angels and saints bring light to the world. Well, that's what New Bedford thought of themselves as doing as well. Uh, and that's important the, 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 for later in the story when you're asking questions about, well, why was whaling so important to these people? You know, why were they trying to commemorate it? Why were they trying to memorialize it? You know, why did they make some assumptions about, you know, how important it was to everyone else? This moment where James Almay is creating the city seal is a nice place to start because it sort of takes that, those assumptions about how important whaling was to this group and then lets us sort of test that many decades later when the progress becomes a museum. I do find it interesting how it's almost criminal today to do whale hunting, but back then it was an, an entire industry. To, but today it's almost criminal. It was, to... it, you know, often it was, you know, often it was talked about in the same breath as fisheries. You know, we still have fisheries today. Um, yeah. You know, although overfishing is certainly, you know, an important topic, um, as was overfishing of, of whales, even though they're not fish, they're mammals. Uh, and interesting that it was often talked about in kind of the same way as, as agriculture. Um, the whale ship was essentially a slaughterhouse in the same way that a pig goes through the, the different stages in a slaughterhouse um, so that we have, you know, you know, everything from sausage to, to pork chop. You know, a whale also sort of went through that same process. It just happened to be out at sea um, as opposed to, uh, you know, an assembly line within within a butchery. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there, you know, I think it's important absolutely to, to recognize, you know, why whaling doesn't have a place in modern society and shouldn't have a place in modern society, but to also see how it was viewed as an extractive industry in the same way that we view um, agriculture and, and fisheries and other extractive uses. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, which brings us uh, to another character, David Kempton. Who was he and why is he? What does he have to do with the story? Kempton is what is known as a, a whaling agent. And I spend a chapter sort of talking about the whaling agent for, for a couple reasons. One, he's the guy that actually gives my great great grandfather his first captain job. Um, so he sort of fits into the narrative that way. But I thought the idea of the agent was actually interesting as well in this process because we, we, we don't really think about the guy behind the scenes. And that's really what the whaling agent was. And, and sort of in this chapter, I actually compare him to a Hollywood producer. You know, so you, if you have a, a motion picture that comes out, there's this, the guy that sort of pulled all the strings and made everything happen. Um, and that's sort of what a whaling agent did. You know, a whaling voyage was a, was a, a very complex enterprise. You know, you had 
you didn't just have a whaling ship and a bunch of guys. You know, you had supplies, you had uh, gear, you had sails and rope. Um, you had relationships with consulates around the world um, so that when, you know, a whale ship had managed to come into a good, good stroke of luck and had, had rendered a lot of whale oil, um, rather than keeping it on the ship, they were able to offload it in uh, ports, you know, everywhere from Brazil to uh, Japan. Um, so there's this wide network of, of, of international tracking and accounting um, that the agent is responsible for. There's insurance, there's contracts. And so, you know, I thought, I, so I just devote this chapter to David Kempton, who is not a major agent. In fact, you know, uh, one list I found for New Bedford listed about 29 of the major agents and David Kempton was number 28. Um, so he's not a big player, but he is, you know, he is a player and he's, he's another good example of sort of someone who chose this life. You know, he, he, the Kempton family were not whalers. Uh, he is the only one in his, of his generation and of his lineage that goes into whaling. And he does it at a very precarious time, you know, sort of even, as he's going into the industry, even he could see that it was starting to decline. This may be more risky than it used to be a generation ago. Right. But he sticks with it, you know, and he, he goes into it, he, he sort of almost doubles down on, on whaling at a time where it's very clearly going, going in, into its spiral. And I think that's really interesting. You know, why, do, why do men and women, although for whaling it was just men, why do people sort of gravitate to this in a very psychological way? You know, what sort of supersedes the dollars and cents and becomes more emotional, becomes more identity, becomes more tied to, uh, you know, something you want to be a part of as opposed to something you have to be a part of. And I think Kempton is really a good example of that. And again, I think that sort of lens um, is important for later in the story when we were asking questions about the museum to whaling um, and, and, you know, why it exists and why people, you know, wanted to elevate whaling to this sort of uh, iconic place at the World's Fair. Um, it was people like David Kempton who, you know, sort of kept whaling alive and kept it going when he could have he could have, and he eventually does walk away from the industry because it just isn't fruitful anymore. But did they come from a rich family or did, and, and how did they get the contacts to become a so-called agent as you described in us? They so, must have had some contacts if already. Oh, some, if yeah. So, so absolutely some of the richest families in New Bedford um, made their money by being willing agents. You know, that, that is the source of income that it becomes um, the revenue stream. You know, for someone like Kempton, what was interesting and what was interesting about whaling and New Bedford is every day folks in New Bedford also invested in whaling. Very small percentages. You know, uh, Herman Melville actually jokes in Moby Dick about, you know, how you could buy basically two nails and a plug on a whaling ship. You know, that was your share uh, of the whaling voyage was, was two nails and a plank. Um, but for folks like Kempton, who maybe, you know, didn't come from rich families, you know, you could buy a little share in a whaling voyage, and if it was successful, then you could roll that over into a, a little larger share, a little larger share after that. Now, remember what I was saying before about, you know, the crew also have their share. So you see, start to see just how complex this is. You have people on shore in New Bedford that have nothing that, that are not going out to sea, they're bakers, they're carpenters, uh, pastors even. Um, so it was, it was kind of like an early voyage. days. It was kind of like an early days of stock and trade, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and New Bedford was very proud of the fact that the money was kept in New Bedford. That they didn't have to go to outside banks and firms and uh, you know New York and 
and places like that to ask for the money that the people of New Bedford invested in whaling voyages and, of course, reaped the rewards of those voyages. And someone like David Kempton could roll those, those into a greater and greater piece of the whaling industry until, of course, he begins in the ships himself and, and becomes, as you said, a whaling agent. Right. And what, what, what about the ship's pardon? Can you tell me about that ship? So the, the, the progress itself? Uh, the ship in general. So and the story. Well, yeah. So maybe this is a good time to go ahead and the, the, the book is called, you know, The Last Voyage of the Whaling Bark Progress. And it's funny that, you know, it actually takes me a while in the book to, to get to the progress and stuff, get to this whaling ship. And that that's intentional. I want people to sort of you know, get a sense of the industry and get a sense of the importance and get a sense of you know the structure. But eventually, yeah, you hit, you fought, you discover the progress. You discover the whaling ship itself. Um, it is a whaling bark. A bark is one of the the varieties of whaling ship. It has to do with the uh, the rigging and the sails and you know how how it's uh, it's structured. Um, a bark is is one of the larger whaling ships. But even at the end of the day, it's about you know sort of stem to stern, nose nose to tail, about the same size as an airplane. You know, but a 747. So imagine being on, you know, something of that length for four years of your life. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how dirty it was. Um, there was uh, many jokes about the fact that you could smell a whaling ship uh, well before you could see one. Um, they were just, you know, they were uh, coated with, with the smoke from, from the boil down of this, this whale blubber. Um, and, um, you know, they were ultimately, you know, very difficult vessels to live on, you know, as all maritime, uh, vessels were at the, at this period, you know, none of these were luxurious, uh, but whaling especially was, was, was difficult. But having said that, a whale ship was still a really majestic site, um, and people talked about, you know, a whaling ship in port or a whaling ship coming into port, um, you know, with full sails and, 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 you know, be still being moved by it. Still, you know, even, even as they were more common, you know, people talked about how, how beautiful a whaling ship could be, even as dirty and melly as, as they were in reality. Um, and, you know, when we get to the point that the progress is actually headed to Chicago, um, you know, all of the, the accounts talked about how beautiful it was, how it was freshly painted, how it was painted red and white, um, how, you know, all the banners flew from it. You know, so, so on the one hand, you know, again, my book is full of dichotomies. On the one hand, the whale ship was almost a prison for these whalemen in these very dirty, very rancid, very dangerous, very cramped conditions. And on the other hand, you know, still had this sort of iconic place in American mythology that would stir people even to tears um, when when a whale ship would depart uh, because not you know because of of how long it would be gone, but also just how beautiful they were. And the progress, I think, was was an important piece of that. Right, and you mentioned her before, but you mentioned that this woman Eliza was was it common for a woman to join the journey or was she like in a unique case tell me about her a little bit so, so the person uh, that i use in this chapter is is the captain's wife and that would have been the only woman that was allowed to to be on on a whale ship would be the cat that's the captain's prerogative um was to bring his wife along um and what is interesting is there's a chapter in the book um, where the progress is, is featured and it's part of its history, part of its story, part of its lore um, having taking place in the 1870s. And there was a huge disaster in the Arctic. Uh, whale ships had sort of shifted focus and were much more seasonal. And so pretty much the entire New Bedford whaling fleet was in the Arctic uh, um, for 1871. And 
and this this was sort of common at the time. And the progress was among them. And what happened was, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. This is connected to your question. What happens is the ice um, shifts, it, the weather changes in a way that they weren't expecting. Um, and pretty much all of the, the whaling ships become crushed in ice, become trapped. And basically you know, someone described it as uh, pushing on, on an egg and having a crack, the eggshell cracking. And this happened to the entire uh, whaling fleet except for seven ships. And uh, one of those seven ships was the Progress. Now, the reason this is all connected to your question is in addition to about a thousand whalers, you know, captains, crew, um, and, and, you know, first mates and, and, uh, and the crew, there were about, and I forget the exact number, but it was about 17 to 20 women and children. Um, and these were the captains, wives, and kids. And so you have this really dramatic scene in the Arctic where over a thousand, mostly men, but women and children too, having to flee over, you know, ice cold water, frigid temperatures, uh, risking hypothermia, risking their lives to get to the seven ships that are left, um, over a thousand of them trying to get to these seven ships. And what is amazing is all of them, including the women and children, made it. Not a single fatality occurred um, in the Arctic disaster of 1871. Um, and so, and the progress, of course, one of those seven ships that collects this, this you know, group of refugees, former whalers, now refugees. Uh, but I think people would be surprised that women and children were among them. But again, this was, a, this was the captain's prerogative. This was something. And like I said, I think, you know, one study put that about one in three captains sort of took advantage of this um, on their voyages. As far as I know, my great-great-grandfather, Captain Gifford, did not hit my great-great-grandmother, Lucy, as far as I know, did not accompany him on any of his voyages or if she did for only a short period of time, not the whole voyage. Right. And can you tell me a little bit more about the journey through the Arctic, Arctic if you will? Well, so by, by the 1870s, the, the purpose of whaling has shifted. You know, we talked about how, um, you know, it was built on the idea of producing light product, light bearing product, whale oil, uh, lighthouse oil, uh, thermosetti candles. By the 1870s, that had shifted. Uh, new products were available. Uh, many cities had gas lines for gas lighting. Uh, kerosene uh, was being produced out of petroleum products. The discovery of petroleum, you know, kickstarted that. And so, by you know, really after the American Civil War onwards, uh, whaling sort of had to come up with a new product. What they came up with was rather ingenious, which is baleen. Now, baleen is what it creates the, or what is in the jaws of uh, whales like blue whales um, and, and whales that don't eat meat, but they eat krill. The baleen is, is what works as a sieve uh, for a whale to suck in all the water and sort of get the plankton out uh, from that. The reason this was so interesting for whalers is baleen was extremely flexible as a product. And so if you manage to capture a whale and kill it and then strip out the baleen, and there might be you know, 30 uh, strips of baleen uh, taller than a man uh, in a, in a good-sized whale, that could be used in everything from eyeglasses to buggy whips to umbrellas. You know, anything that we might associate with plastic today, um, that, that sort of flexible material um, is what baleen could be used for. But the number one use is women's corsets. Mm. Women's mm -hmm. corsets save the whaling industry because the best corsets were made from baleen. 
from from this product from Wales. Um, and so the, so the industry really shifts on a not on a dime, but shifts you know in a relatively fast fashion um, to pursue a different kind of whale and pursue a different product from a whale. And the problem is those kinds of whales congregate in the Arctic uh, for the summer. That's that's their feeding ground. Uh, the water is super rich with krill. Um, it's where they fatten up. Um, and so if you're a whaler, you have to go to the Arctic in order to, to pursue your whaling. You know, I, I, it almost goes without saying the Arctic is hugely dangerous. You know, if whaling wasn't already dangerous enough, now add, you know, sub-zero temperatures, uh, ice, ice flows, um, you know, and, and just, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, life risking circumstances um, on top of what was already a very dangerous industry. So that's what happens in 1871 is, you know, the luck sort of runs out from the whaling fleet and, and you know, just one after another, after another sort of, you know, ducks in a shooting gallery fall um, until there's only seven left from, from that season. Um, and, you know, all in pursuit of, of this sort of new product and new type of whale. Well, we don't keep a little hand up right now and uh, talk about, I think this was, if I'm not mistaken, a maybe when they tried to get the ship over across to the, the new Guildford, is that correct? So there was a little theft problem. Yes. Can, you, can you tell me about the theft problem? You talked about it in the book. Uh, so which problem? Can you? Sorry, you broke up uh, a little bit there. We, we just skipped. We just skipped that part. But the, well, well, tell me about the end. The dying industry. The dying industry of the whale. In the yeah. Whale so. So by the time um, the world's the Chicago World's Fair is called the World's Columbian Exposition rolls around, um, it's slated for eighteen ninety three. Um, whaling has really declined. Um, and in fact, in New Bedford itself, um, a whole new industry has sprung up around cotton and, and cotton mill manufacturing. And whaling is just this sort of tiny fragment of what you think. Um, but as I said, sort of all along, it, it always had this sort of mythological place. It always had this sort of place in popular culture, um, the sense of adventure, the sense of danger. Um, you know, the lure of the sea. Um, and so even though New, New Bedford has largely turned its back on whaling because it's no longer profitable and because there's, you know, profits to be made in, in other industries like cotton, there is this interest in memorializing it and commemorating it and sort of creating um, a monument to this this industry. And it's, and it's a sort of, strange moment because whaling isn't dead yet you know my great grandfather has evidence of that you know there were still whalers pursuing it but it was clearly you know a shadow of what it had been and so the the, the sort of leaders of new bedford the elite of new bedford come up with the idea of of creating a, a museum on, on a whale ship at the Chicago World's Fair, at the World's Fair of 1893. And this is, this is the famous white city. You know, we still, still talk about you know, the World's Fair in American history as, as a really important moment. So I, you know, I think their, their instincts were right that you know, this could be an opportunity. This could be a chance to sort of tell the world about whaling um, and sort of make it uh, this really sort of important moment on this world stage in Chicago. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that's, that's not what happens. That's sort of the, the focus of, of, especially the second half of the book, uh, sort of all the things that go wrong, all the reasons that um, what could have been, you know, a good idea, viable idea, you know, starts to fall apart and starts to become very metastasized and, and and become something very different by the time the, the fair opens. What would you say the last real ships came 
Dark, Dark to Love for June. What the year? What would you say that was? So, so sort of the old style of whaling with, with you know these these um, sailborne whale ships does continue um, all the way through the 1890s and into the 20th century. Um, and then, you know, there's sort of a new and in, uh, mini industry born out of steamships, um, you know, that, that sort of continues whaling for a while. Um, and then, you know, it's much later in the 20th century that more modern ships begin whaling. And that's when you have the sort of beginning of, of the American or the, the modern uh, environmental movement of save the whales and 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 but by then whaling looks so different you know it's so much more mechanized it's so much more um um just uh not even a, a glimmer of what had been in the 1800s and into the the early 1900s that that was really you know, a different era that ended, you know, sometime in the early 1900s. Right. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, do you have anything to promote on the social media where people can find you if they wish to take contact with you or follow you on anything? So um, absolutely. Uh, the, the book is available on Amazon and my contact information is, uh, is also on there with, uh, with my bio. Um, and yeah, I def if anyone is interested in these questions of, you know, uh, whaling and, and commemoration, um, I, of course, encourage you to, to pursue the book, but also feel free to reach out to me uh, as well. Thank you so much for coming. This has been Well That Aged Well. We are on Instagram at the tag that aged well, that aged well. I'm also trying something different. We, because I'm trying to go on an app called Stereo. It's a new, new app for podcasters where, where I won't just focus on history, but I, I do try to get any sort of guests on. It's a, sort of a new side project. You can find this podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Pocket Cast, wherever most podcasts are. Or you are also on YouTube at well, that as well. I will link your anything you wish me to link in the description below. Thank you so much for coming. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.